Welcome to Sidewalks Entertainment. Seen across the country and online, it's the award-winning TV series featuring celebrity interviews, music, lifestyle segments, and artistic talents. Join our on-air personalities as we bring to you a new path to entertainment. Hi, welcome to Sidewalks Entertainment. I'm Sylvia Cal, and today I'm here with a legend. I am gonna put it that way. <laughs> His name is Kino McQueenie. He's one of my favorite singers ever, and I'm sure one of your favorite singers too. The lead singer and creator of the band Big Mountain. Ooh, baby, I love your way. <laughs> hey. Hi, Gina, thanks for coming. Ah, oh, Sylvia, so nice to be with you. So, you know, you have a very long career, over 30 years in the music industry, and you've had a lot of hits. But of course, everybody always asks you about that one hit that we all remember, Baby, I Love Your Way. How did the idea of Baby, I Love Your Way come about? Well, um, Big Mountain released its first album in 1992. Uh, there was a song on that album called Touch My Light that uh, was a big hit, especially in this area in Southern California. And it was all over the radio. It was sort of something that uh, was new and fresh because reggae music was still relatively new in the industry. Not a lot of people knew a lot about it. And um, in 19, I guess 1993, they started planning the uh, Reality Bites the movie, movie mm -hmm. and the soundtrack with uh, Winona Ryder and Ethan Hawke, Ben Stiller, and uh, the Peter Frampton version of the song Baby I Love Your Way was in the movie, uh -huh. Reality Bites. So the person that was in charge of the soundtrack uh, decided, hey, why don't we do a reggae version of this? Reggae, again, was novel and uh, we were hep and cool and young and it was like we were bringing this new exotic music you know to to the soundtrack um yeah and that that's that's the way it all it all happened it's so you know I, I don't spend a whole lot of time in the los angeles area nowadays but thinking about recording that song it was recorded here in in los angeles and I've been here for a couple of days and just driving around and seeing all the places. It reminds me of those times, you know, and it was it was just an exciting time. You're talking the 90s and uh, everything ha started to happen really quick after that. Yes. Yes, and, and you mentioned, right, Baby, I Love Your Way is a cover of a song from Peter Frampton, which is funny because most people would think is, uh, is your original song because some artists make a cover of a song and they are the ones who make the song famous, right? Mm -hmm. um, what did Peter Frampton say to you? <laughs> did he thank you for all the cars and houses he bought thanks to you? You know what? Um, we've exchanged information through, um, through managers and stuff like that. Uh, I've never talked to him personally. You've, in, th in what, 20 years? Yes. You've years. never talked We've to never Peter communicated Frampton. directly. It's funny, you know, because I, I was just talking to um, Al Anderson of uh -huh. the Whalers. Yes. Who he's a friend of Peter Frampton. Oh. And he goes, "Have you ever met Pete?" And I'm all, I, I, every time somebody asks me that, it's like, no. How come? <laughs> How is that even possible? Wow. You know, I think that uh, music business keeps you busy, man. You know what I mean? And and. And for some reason, it's just, I, I think that it's going to happen uh, sometime soon because, you know, I keep running into people and bumping into people. They say, yeah, I'm, I'm a friend of Peter Frampton. It's like, and you're like, I'm not. <laughs> I've never met him. But say hi. <laughs> I'm very close to him and indirectly. Yes, indirectly, right? But uh, but I was a big fan of, you know, Peter Frampton. I, I, I had his album. He, he, his big album came out in 1976, Frampton Comes Alive. It was huge. I mean, it 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 sold like 13 million, and that at that point that was a record. So, I always remember that. You know, I I remember, and and it was 70s. 70s were cool. So what an honor for you, right? If you were a big fan of him. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I was already familiar with the song, and 
You know, it was just, like I said, it was, it was a cool time. Reggae music at that point still had not had much ra radio success. Mm -hmm. It was already, you know, very much um, a grassroots and, and sort of a niche like uh, category of music. But um, I was part of a, of a wave of uh, reggae bands, Inner Circle, Maxi Priest, you just yes. saw Maxi Priest, us. Um, and then, of course, UB40, they got started a little bit earlier than we did, but then they, they, you know, Red Red Wine was bumping hard. So it was exciting, you know, to bring this music to the world. And we were all deeply, deeply, I think anybody who's been involved in reggae like that, especially at that time, we, we took reggae music very personal because it not only was you know, a music that we love to perform and write and, and we were making a living um, playing it. But it, it also, reggae music changes your life because it really does. Because it has a message, it has right? A huge it's message. not only music. Exactly. So and you are, you are very vocal about the messages that you want to give to the world. You know, it, it, it's being somebody from California, um, It touched me, I think, you know, just in a different way. I mean, Maxie's from England, but he's from Jamaican roots, you mm -hmm. know. Inner Circle, they're from Jamaica. A lot of the bands were from England or either Jamaica. And, and we were different. And Yeah, because you were saying, you know, he was from England and uh, roots from Jamaica. Your roots are Mexican. Yeah. Which most people don't know, but Kino McQueen <laughs> speaks perfect Spanish. <laughs> and he's a Chicano. Gracias. So, what made you do reggae? Because your family, they were mariachis, right? Well, I mean, they, my, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather was kind of like a conjunto player. He was, he was a farmer, mm -hmm. but he had a band and he lived in the Coachella Valley. And um, part of the way they just coped with life was playing music. Um, I have two uncles that are musicians. so. I've always been surrounded by lots of amazing Mexican music and then of course Mexican music, a lot of the music that was influenced uh, or that influenced Mexico came from Cuba, you know, boleros and, and uh, so yeah, corridos, uh, rancheras, mariachi, whatever, it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a, a big part of who I am and you know, reggae music, I mean I always, immediately, it was like wow, you know, this music is really done so much for the African diaspora and helping the people all over the world really understand the importance of Africa and the importance of maintaining your roots and your identity. And I said, you know, I want to do that same thing for Mexican Americans here in the United States who we also have a bit of an identity problem. <laughs> Yes, so, yes, it's so getting reggae, better, but yes. yes. so reggae was a way for me to do it. Oh, perfect. So you started doing reggae, you very quickly succeed very much, and suddenly, Baby I Love Your Way, that it became so big that at some point you didn't take success so well, right? What right. happened there? You know, it was, uh, like I said, I mean, I really started this music business um, from a very innocent standpoint in terms of, um, you know, I was, I, I've always been inspired and driven, um, like you said, to spread a message. And um, the whole reason Big Mountain got started in the first place, we, you know, we're talking, this is like post-Vietnam, You know, there was a lot going on. There was a lot of uh, human rights struggles going on, different identity struggles um, going on. Marches, you know, I'm from that whole era. My grandmother was a hardcore hippie. She was an activist. My aunt was an activist. So I came from a very activist sort of family. And I equated my involvement with reggae music, and I used reggae music very early on, as a way to, to spread a message. And, you know, there was a lot of messages that were near and dear to us, but one message that I gravitated to because I lived it um, was the, the support of immigrants in the United States. And 
my grandparents were immigrants. My yes. grandparents were Mexican immigrants. They came here, very poor people, just campesinos, you know, just farm workers. Um, that's how my grandmother and grandfather started in, in, in this country. So I had a firsthand connection to this whole way of life and just the, the predicament that so many Mexican Americans and immigrants on the whole find when they're trying to improve their lives or trying to improve the lives of their family. Um, I took it real personal. Growing up in San Diego, I got to witness the border transform, right? When I yes. was in junior high school, the border was just a fence. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I'm an adult, the border is like the Berlin Wall, right? So, you know, it, it, that was probably the issue that really galvanized me and got me connected to reggae music. And the whole success aspect was something like, you know, I'm just a singer. I can sing whatever song you want me to sing. They brought me the song, Baby, I Love Your Way, and I was like, yeah, I'd like to sing that. And the next thing I know, I'm like one of the most famous dreadlock guys in the whole world. And that was intense. It was really hard for me to really understand success and, 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 and fame. Um, so, yeah, I, I could have done a lot better job at processing that. So basically, yeah, you got overwhelmed and you cut your dreadlocks, right? <laughs> I did. And then you quit music. <laughs> it. So why did you cut your dreadlocks? What did the, dre the dreadlocks you mean know to what? you? You know what? It's funny because it was really, um, oh God. You know, like if I was to really like put my finger on the button, I think it was to sabotage. Your career. My career and just sort of our relationship with the record company. I was having a tough time relating to the record company. The record company, you gotta understand, they didn't know anything about reggae. Mm -hmm. So it was just like, we want another Baby I Love Your Way, can we have a whole album full of Baby I Love Your Ways? And I'm saying no. You know, we're a message band. We're a band that, that uh, we're here to put out provocative messages to cha challenge people. Yes, I have no problem singing pop music. I love pop music, I grew up with pop music. Um, but, but a that's certain not amount the career you wanted to, to... No, we have to have a balance because, mm -hmm. you know, reggae music is, is a music that was created by the descendants of slaves in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. It has a tremendous amount of importance. Um, and I knew that I was going to be targeted, you know. First off, I didn't want to just come off as a pop musician. Mm -hmm. I knew that, you know, people were going to be expecting me to hold up a tradition of being politically, um, you know, knowledgeable and understanding really what the what this music was all about and how important it is to the Jamaican people and how it is important to African uh, diaspora people all over the world, African Americans. In my case, being from the United States, so so yeah, it was a it was a big struggle and and it was it was like you know I I really did I just wasn't happy. Yeah. And when you're happy, or you're not happy. You, you know, have to make a change. You make a change, yeah. and that was that was the way that was the way I did it. Yeah, I cut my dreads, and this was like "Baby, I Love Your Way" came out in 1994. In 1995, I was like, "Boom, oh, I'm only, done with only this." Only one year later. <laughs> yes. Wow, yes. that was fast. Yes. And uh, so you quit music, and what did you do? I, um, I started. I mean, I went back to school. Um, I initially started to study sociology and ethnic studies and then I received this um, offer to start a music program or really a like a music studio, a multimedia um, music studio. This is, you know, if you can imagine this is the early 2000s so the whole digital age is just getting going. Um, you know, digital recording. Right now we're using a hard disk, you know. Back in the 90s, uh, it was all tape, right? Yes. You know? So, so it, was, it was an exciting time technologically and I got to be a high school teacher for about eight years and then I went and, and actually taught music at an elementary school for two years after that. But I, yeah, I went to school and then I became a teacher. Wow, what a change. I figure your, your students were like, we is this really my teacher? Like, am I dreaming? <laughs> and then you went back to music yeah. after a while, right? What I made, did. What made you go back? 
You know, I, I think, uh, I mean, I've always, I always knew I was going to come back. Uh, I am a musician. I am an artist at heart. And, um, you know, uh, another thing I didn't mention was that this was the whole piracy era. So all of a sudden, the, the value of music went through the floor, you right? You know, there was no way for record companies to make money. The, nobody bought CDs. Mm -hmm. So it took a while for the whole industry to recalibrate itself. And, and then once, uh, but all throughout those years, you know, musicians, we didn't make royalties. Yeah, that, that's, that's something very interesting that probably people don't know. Back in the day, you have a big hit, like Baby I Love Your Way, but because it's not your original song, you don't make money off of it, right? Right, like Whitney Houston didn't didn't make one penny of uh, "I Will Always Love You," either, right? Right, right. So that's crazy. Yeah. Um, but nowadays it's different, right? Well, the streaming streaming uh, brought on um, the opportunity for them to reassess uh, royalties and who gets royalties and performers. Now we receive royalties, but you're right. Back in the day, in um, antenna radio, land-based radio, uh, the performers don't get anything from that. It all goes to the songwriter. So That's why I was saying, did he ever thank you for all the <laughs> houses he bought thanks to you? I love Peter Frampton, okay? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything against no, him. He's an amazing songwriter and, and uh, I know that and one day... And you're a big fan. <laughs> and I'm a big fan, so... And I'm very fortunate to, to, to his song be yeah such a part of my life and and uh but uh but yeah it's, but yeah, it's, it's funny how but now works, things are right? different you know now things are different satellite the r radio that we hear in the internet performers do get paid mm -hmm. and um so it, it 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 really kind of like wow it's like the, i mean i i remember the day that all of a sudden i looked at my bank account and it was i go where did this money come from you know and i found out that you know that that the um, well since then it, it really kind of gave me an incentive to get back into the music business and, 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 and change things around. And, um, and so, you know, now Big Mountain's got about 10 years that we've been really, really focused again. And um, reggae's doing good again. Um, you know, we just had a big show the other day at the Hollywood Bowl with UB40 mm -hmm. and Maxi Priest and the original Wailers. So, you know, it, 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 life is very interesting and you have to I, I'm learning you have to be prepared for times when things just don't click mm -hmm. you know you can't you can't give up you have to endure you have to try to find meaning in what you're doing but sometimes the doors just don't open and you can keep on knocking on those doors um, and you just have to wait so much in this business as you probably have learned is about timing it's about luck. It's about networking. Yeah. You have to be out there. And, you know, for so many years, I wasn't. For so many years, I was doing something else. And that's not, you know, entertainment business. You have to be in the scene. A hundred percent. Totally. Yeah. How was the comeback? It was it like, of course, not like starting over because you already had a name, but was it a little bit like, oh, I was here and now I have to start again from here? You know what? It's a little bit of that. It's humbling in some ways. But I think entertainment business is humbling anyway, right? Because yes. you start to think that you deserve the fame per se, right? So, you know, whether or not you deserve fame or not is, is totally objective, right? I mean, you have to just... Uh, uh, sort of uh, assume that uh, that you have something to give the people and that's why you're doing it you continue to do it um, but yeah it has been a little bit of a grind um, at the same time you know it it's to be back with my band again because I was able to rekindle my band and get my band back together that I had back in the 90s and I put this amazing band together and then you know we just kind of ran out of steam um, and we're 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 having a lot of fun. We yeah. really we really really are. I mean, we're still. Um, I'd say we're still making our way back into this scene, and we're learning a lot. So much has changed, but what's beautiful is that we did take a rest. I mean, I think in a long run, hopefully it'll be the right thing because I really do feel like 
not worn out. I, my voice feels very strong. Um, and then I have a better perspective, you know. Yes. It's hard to be young. Yes. You know, it, 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 these people that say, oh, God, I wish I was young again, I think, oh, my God. You don't know anything, no right? No way. <laughs> I would never want to go back. I know. You know what I mean? It's like I was there, that was that time. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's impossible to really be able to process things. Yes. And, with, you know, with experience, um, you appreciate things, and you, you, you know not to take things personal. Exactly. You let things this just industry, fly off. Yeah. It's very important to know that. Super. And I know that you like to support young artists that are trying to make it in the industry, right? Absolutely. Which is beautiful because in this super hard industry, if you don't have anyone helping you, it's almost impossible. So you just made a single with a Colombian singer, Maria, in this life. It's a beautiful song. Thank you. Did you have anyone supporting you when you started? You know, um, I did. I mean, fortunately for me, um, I got into a situation where I had a lot of very famous legacy reggae musicians that I was rubbing elbows with. Maxi Priest, for instance. I mean, I met Maxi in 1992, before, oh, before Baby Love. Oh, before you were. Oh, okay. And, um, and then so when I met Maxi, I was opening up for him, and then, then you know, and I was way down. We were at the we were, we were at the very you know opening up the show, and then uh, two years later, I have the biggest hit in in the world. And you he know? was opening up your show. <laughs> and then sometimes he would open up. We would trade. We would go back and forth. But you know, um, and then there were so many artists uh, during those years because we did some huge tours. We did three big reggae sunsplash tours here in the U.S. We went to Asia and Europe. Um, and, you know, observing, I mean, it, all of the Bob Marley's sort of band and those legacy artists, Judy Moa and Marcia Griffiths and, and then the Wailers and, um, oh, God, it just goes on and on, Toots. And then some of my, you know, really, really big influences, bands like Steel Pulse and Third World, because we were a band. We were, we were very much band-oriented type of act. Um, and, yeah. And they were all they were all so loving. I mean, there was a couple of people that intimidated. You can say shit now, huh? You can, <laughs> they intimidated the shit out of me. You can say that. Yeah, here. I'm not gonna mention anybody's name, but the vast majority were so giving, and Maxi especially. Maxi, um, I really did my my sound evolved very quickly. Like in the in the couple of years that I met after I met Maxi, my sound changed a lot because it was like Maxi was just so R&B oriented and he just had such an interesting approach and I was forced to watch him over and over again because yes. we were always touring together you know what I mean so naturally he influenced me greatly amazing and like I, like I said before you have a Mexican background and when you came back uh, to singing you were really supporting the Mexicans and the immigrants in this town with your single deportation nation yes and now, you want to make music in Spanish? Yes. What are you planning? I'm in the process of uh, working on a whole album in Spanish. A whole uh, first time you do a whole album yes. in Spanish. Yes. Yes, and we're releasing an, uh, a single that's only. Well, we've probably maybe done a couple of Spanish um, singles before, but this was this is going to be the first. It's by a band called La Mafia. From Mexico? From, from Me I, they're actually from Houston. They're Mexican-Americans. Um, Mi Vida, yeah. Mi Vida. Vida, Mi vida, vida se llama la canción. Vida. So pay attention for Vida. Vida, yo te amo más que el aire que respiro. So uh, I'm working with a, a band in Monterrey, a band called uh, Bamboo, um, an amazing uh, Mexican reggae band. And they've been helping me with the production. Uh, you know, so it, it's, I'm really fortunate to be, because, you know, I'm a little insecure about my Spanish. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, somehow you are, but we're like, wait, but your Spanish is perfect. How are you insecure? But uh, well, it's, 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 it's the Chicanos, man. Chicanos, we have an identity crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> and do you have any more covers coming up? Yeah, you know, um, 
Well, actually, yes. Um, we also recorded a full English album in Jamaica last year. And in December, we'll be releasing um, an, a, a single of Hotel California. Oh, I can't Eagles. wait to hear that one. Yeah. <laughs> we recorded it, um, the great Sly Dunbar, and it's an amazing uh, producer and drummer from uh, Jamaica. He, he helped us out with that. Um, and uh, Delroy Pottinger, uh, uh, an engineer and producer in, in Jamaica, also helped us out with that. So, yeah, that's going to be that's going to be exciting. And and yeah, so we, we, we've been holding on to this album because we weren't sure we were maybe going to sign with a record, this one record company. And then this other record company came. So we've been we're like a year behind with releasing this album. But but that's going to be fun because this is the first album that we recorded the whole album in Jamaica. Oh, nice. Yeah. And are you tired? I was with you yesterday all day. And in one day, maybe like 200 times people asked you, can you say hi to my niece or somebody? And, you know, and can you say, baby, I love your way? You know, we... So, so I figured that every single day for 20 years, are you ever tired of... Well, and people like myself, right? Every interview that you go to, they ask you to sing Baby, I Love Your Way. Are you tired of it or not? You know, it's so funny because we, we were talking about Maria because mm -hmm. she makes fun of me every time because she says, hi, can you say this, uh, hi to so-and-so? And it's like, well, if I just say, hi, this is Kino from Big Mountain, hi, <laughs> right? It's like, okay. It's missing they're, something. Yeah, they're sitting there going, okay, Kino, okay, cool. But so I usually put in the tag, and I'm sending you a big, ooh, baby, I love your way. Anyway, <laughs> the first time I did that, Maria was like, fell on the floor. She thought that was so funny. And, <laughs> and then the other day at the Hollywood Bowl, of course, she, uh, she was there as a guest artist uh, with us. Um, every, time, every time somebody would ask me, hey, can you say I am so-and-so or blah, 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 she would be looking at me like, come on, do it, do <laughs> it, do it. <laughs> Um, you know, I, there was a point in my career where Baby I Love Your Way got on my nerves because it's, it was such a huge song and in some ways it became bigger than Big Mountain, my band. And uh, so I did resent that. With maturity and also having children that you're trying to get through college, uh, it doesn't make it doesn't bother me anymore. <laughs> you learn how <laughs> to like, appreciate you know, it. Just pay me, man. <laughs> Give me my money. I don't care. I'll sing whatever you want. I'll sing "Baby, I Love Your Way," uh, and you know, and then and then there's just the aspect of appreciating, you know, and just understanding that so many there's so many talented people out there that spend their whole life um, trying to have the opportunity to make a living mm -hmm. with what they love to do, right? And, and, and I can't. am, and they can't. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so for me to not appreciate the, the wonderful opportunities that the song has given me and, and to be able to make a living and feed my family with this, then I, then I wouldn't, you know, then that, that would be totally not appreciating this amazing gift that life has given me. Exactly, it's good to have appreciation. So, Thank you so much, Sidewalks Entertainment. We will see you next time. And can we say goodbye with... <laughs> right? Because you like it, so... I'm Kino from Big Mountain with the magnificent Silvia Kahl. And I'm sending you a big... Ooh, baby, I love your way. Every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're good, girl. <laughs> Thank you. She's super talented, this woman. <laughs> I forget, every, every, a new talent comes out every time. <laughs> For more full-length celebrity interviews, visit us at SidewalksTV.com, our YouTube channel, and don't forget to follow us on social media.